Okay, my next guest is Rianne. Rianne, thank you for coming in. Now, this is the bit that's uh, been very, very at the forefront of most of the news right now because your session, um, we've gone down from the trace gas orbiter to the atmosphere and now we're looking at the, the lander, the Schiaparelli lander. Yes. Um, and uh, David asked a question um, saying, has the EDM been in contact um, since shoot deployment, which was obviously the parachute? And we, we've heard broadly about some of the issues around there. What is the lowdown on it? Uh, well, we did hear from it after the shoot deployment. Um, it worked very well as it went through the upper atmosphere. The heat shielding around it was working fine and it slowed down to the right sort of speed. The parachute was deployed correctly, as far as we know, and that slowed it down even further. And the heat shield popped off the front successfully. So a lot of the things that we planned to happen during the descent did happen correctly. There was a point where things didn't go quite to plan. Uh, the radar that um, interacts with the surface to we know what altitude the, uh, the lander is at as it goes down did start operating, so we've got a lot of information on the way down to the surface. Then the parachute was ejected earlier than expected, so it, it was working as it slowed down the lander. After a certain point, the lander lets go of the parachute, so it would then activate uh, retro thruster rockets to lower it right to the surface. The parachute was ejected earlier than expected, the thrusters fired, but not for as long as expected, and then the, uh, the lander stopped talking back to us. So that's when we lost contact, which was about 50 seconds before its expected landing time. And that's as far as we know. Mm. So how important is that then in terms of the whole process of the lander? Because it's obviously taking a lot of data as it's descending. Um, and it got very, very close, didn't it? It did, yes. We've got data actually from uh, an altitude of 120 kilometers all the way down to about one kilometer from the surface. So we've got about 99% of the descent data that we were aiming to capture which uh, for what I'm doing is really important. So I've got most of the data that I was interested in getting. So that definitely is success. Which is fine for you, yes. but what about for everyone else? <laughs> I mean, you say the 99%, yes. is that 1% in terms of the actual, how important is that 1% in terms of the overall picture? I mean, clearly it's a, it's a very important part for the next part of the mission when the rover lands to, to get that last kilometer. It is, and we do want the rover to land successfully across the yeah. last kilometer but we got a huge amount of data for the rest of the descent. So a lot of it was a success and we tested the parachutes, we tested the radar, we know this worked and we can use that data to analyze exactly what went wrong and yeah. hopefully correct it in the future. It is a real shame for the scientists who did have instruments on the lander that were gonna take weather measurements at the surface and they won't get anything back and that is a real shame but yeah. it was not a complete loss. We did get a lot of data during the descent. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, th these things do happen f fairly frequently, you know, in terms of, of this sort of thing. I guess it's, you know, like you say, it's, it's not all necessarily a bad thing. We have mm. got a lot of data from that, but obviously heartbreaking if you've put so long into yes. to researching some of these things as well. You're specifically, I mean, you're looking at Martian dust storms. Yes. Um, and like Liam, you're, you're doing your modeling and you're, you're trying to look at that. So you're going to be getting some of this data back um, and seeing how that compares with your model. Yes. So why are dust storms so important? Uh, dust storms play a big part in the general circulation of the Martian atmosphere because, as Liam was saying, there's not any water really in the Martian atmosphere. Dust is the main constituent of the atmosphere that uh, absorbs solar radiation and heats up. So the heating and the cooling of the atmosphere is really dependent on the amount of dust that's in the atmosphere, which can vary from a very lev background level of dust to a really thick dust storm that can blanket the whole planet for weeks. And we can't always predict when those storms are coming. So the more we know about the atmosphere as it is, the more measurements we can get at the surface as to winds and temperature through the daily and annual cycles, the better we can predict how it will be in the future. And uh, for landers like Schiaparelli, it was going to be, it was battery powered, so it doesn't rely on solar power. So dust storms are not such a problem for it. But if you're sending down a rover or a lander which is solar powered, then having a dust storm obscure the sun for any extended period of time could affect the performance of that uh, lander on the surface. So knowing a bit more about the storms, how thick they are, how frequently, how frequently they, they come across the surface can help us plan missions for the future. 
Mm. No, very important. I mean, like like we were saying before, you know, not every lander has successfully landed, in particular, you know, on Mars as well as other other planets. Um, uh, we asked our audience what uh, a whole range of uh, things reaching their destination: Mars One, Mariner Four, Viking One, um, Nemozi, Mars Ninety Six, Insight, and Phoenix. Um, they have said that uh, Phoenix, Mariner Four, and Viking One um, did reach their destinations. I believe that is correct. Yes. Good. Good. Yeah, we haven't written down the answers. It's a bit of a, <laughs> it's very difficult. Difficult then when you're amazed by all these lovely uh, stars and planets, etc., to remember. But um, it's, it's, I guess the point here you're trying to make is that proportionately it's not always a success. It's not always a su success, no. It's very hard. And a lot of um, orbiters that we've sent to Mars and past have missed the planet or we've lost communication before they got there. Mm. The ratio is getting better in recent years. And InSight hasn't actually made it yet because it's not been launched yet. InSight will be one of the next missions launched. Bit of an so that was, question, yeah, that, that was a bit of a, a trick question. <laughs> OK, so the lander then. So, so we've got this entry, descent and then the landing um, module phase of, of the ExoMars program. Um, as you say, it was a test. Well, to some extent, obviously, Absolutely. it is a test, although there were instruments on board. Um, and uh, we've recorded nearly all of the data down to the surface. Um, some of the instruments there, what were they trying to test? They were trying to, to, to take a look at the surface, but to a great, well, to, to a much less extent than the rover. Yes, we were going to look at the air temperature, mm. the wind speed and direction, look at pressure, humidity, all the sort of weather, weather sensors that you might take on Earth. Yeah. We were going to look at the electric field as well that's near the surface, which yeah. has never been attempted before, so yeah. it's a real shame we won't get that. Uh, but trying to build up the ability to forecast the weather, yeah. if you will. But how critical was that to know? I mean, we've seen here that there are lots of other instruments mm. that are arguably able to get different measurements, but, but, but from the orbit. So how important was that? It wasn't critical. In this case, the lander really was to test the landing technology. Mm. So the science on the surface was a bit of a bonus. It would have been really nice to have. But if we don't have that, that does not adversely affect the next mission necessarily. So can all the critical science be done then from the orbiter for the 2020 mission? Uh, a lot of it can, as well as analysing the data that we did get from Schiaparelli on the landing. Yeah. OK. All right. So we've talked a little bit about what happened then um, during the, the descent. Um, can we talk about some of the um, data that we're hoping to get back and also why that's going to be so important for you? Uh, some of it that's not necessarily important to me, but I think is really interesting, is the data we'll get back from the heat shield, which is this silver side here, when it's flipped upside down. Yes. Uh, we're getting data back from sen thermal sensors inside that, which... We don't have any data from that at all before. So this is how well protected the craft is as it plummets through the atmosphere and heats up due to friction. And you want to protect everything that's inside the craft from that massive heat outside so that it doesn't melt. So it actually becomes a usable instrument when it reaches the surface. And not even NASA have taken those sort of readings before from something descending to the Martian surface. So we don't really know if our heat protection is too much. Perhaps we're sending too much mass up there. If we could reduce the layers of insulation that we're putting on a spacecraft, we can put a bit more science there in the future. So I think that one will be really interesting. For me, it's a lot about how the spacecraft behaved as it was traveling down to the surface. So there were inertial measurement units, there were accelerometers in the craft itself as it descended, as it was plummeting through, through the upper atmosphere and then as it was swinging below the parachute in a bit of a pendulum action. So I can analyze all of that and I can then work out what the wind speeds were like in the upper atmosphere and all the way down to the surface. And I can compare that against the simulations that I've run on the computer models and see how accurate my models are compared to what it actually experienced as it was going down. We can use all this information from a lot of different sensors to build up a whole picture overall. And that's what I'll be doing with it, hopefully. So obviously you're getting data and you're comparing that with your data, mm. but that needs to be interpreted. I mean, how difficult is it to then interpret that data? Uh, it takes... Initially, it takes calibration of the raw data, so I'm relying on the scientists who actually created the instruments that I'm getting data back from to take the raw data, run it through their calibration systems, and then provide me with more intelligible data, which I can then analyse and put on graphs, essentially. Is it compatible essentially. With, with your data, then, in that form, or do you need to perform other transformations? By the time I get it, it will be a set of numbers, which I then have to juggle into a yeah. set that I can compare in a nice graph against my numbers. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a lot of juggling numbers, messing around and making some plots that are actually comparable to human eye rather than just computers. And how specialist do you have to be to, to be able to do some of that? I would love to say very specialist. <laughs> it takes practice. It takes practice and time just to 
get to know how to juggle data and how to present it as well. Because Liam's been talking about this sort of race, I guess, that when you get this <laughs> data, everyone's going to be sitting and analysing that. Mm. Where do you fit in terms of that research field with, with other people who are also going to be very interested in getting that? Is there a difference between the way that you're going to be interpreting something, say, and, and somebody somewhere else might, might look at it? I think everyone will be looking for something slightly different in it. Mm. I will definitely be looking to compare it to my particular atmospheric model. Other people have different models, which they've got different results already, so I could compare my results to their results, and we can both compare our results to what the lander is telling us, so then we can all argue over who had a better match to start off with. How will you, how will you sort that out? <laughs> that will be through various conference presentations and uh, <laughs> arguments and suggestions and um, discussions amongst the scientific community. That sounds fun. <laughs> right, let's go to the hot desk. Sophie and H, uh, I hear you're talking about um, sci-fi versus real life. <laughs> We yes. all know sci-fi is better than real life, don't we? HK's got that one down more than I have. <laughs> I'm taking questions. Yeah. Well, Lisa does say she uh, really likes your uh, DS9 T-shirt, which uh, <laughs> is really cool. We'll have to get a few of those. But um, You're not yeah. talking about Comic-Con again, are well, you? Oh, no. Well, no, you are, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Me and Emma are talking about um, going to the Star Trek conventions and how much fun we had at them. So she's just gone to one recently, and I remember going to my first one a few years ago, which was really fun. But um, da Davin's uh, wondering about uh, the technologies um, in sci-fi shows like uh, Trek, Star Wars, Babylon 5 have influenced um, all the different technologies that we're have come about and we're finding and perhaps any we used on the exo mars mission which uh is quite an interesting thought and perhaps um rian has some thoughts on that but i know um perhaps um <laughs> sophie can ground us a bit yeah. more <laughs> <laughs> She gets very excited to <laughs> Comic Con and Star Trek or Wars or whatever it is. <laughs> I mean, a lot of these questions are really over my head, but um, David had a good one about um, is the effort that we have on Mars and going to Mars, is it sort of something maybe we should sidestep? Should we be concentrating on more lunar missions and lunar bases and things like that and preparing man for life in on the moon? Is that more realistic and more viable maybe than... Um, preparing for life on Mars? That is a very difficult question. I, I suppose it depends what the point is, doesn't it? I think lunar bases are a great standpoint for moving on to Mars. So I think we really should go back to the moon. We should definitely send man back to the moon. And it is a lot easier to get there. It's a much shorter journey time. So it's a really good test base. If we can get people living on the moon, then that would be a really good test for getting people to live on Mars. So the Mars is the destination. The Moon is just a uh, the Moon is a way station. Yeah. So and uh, maybe a supply point on the way. Yeah, I think we should definitely start with the Moon, but we should always aim for Mars. <laughs> well, I know I think David Rothery would uh, disagree with you there. He would, <laughs> he would say we should always aim for Mercury. Well, yes. <laughs> but um, but I guess that that's one of the interesting things about this is that there's so many people looking at very similar sorts of technologies, very similar sorts of um, things that they're measuring, but on different planets. I mean, in planetary sciences, we, we've seen you guys are obviously all interested in Mars, but there are lots of other people at the Open University who are doing various, various other things, in particular the Moon. And there's this Moon's MOOC as well that's um, starting again that you might want to um, join in if you haven't uh, already already had a go at that one. Um, but, but there are so many different things. How does it work then? I mean, you say conference presentations and things. You're not all just going to be arguing about Mars, etc. How does it work fitting in some of the things that you're finding here in terms of the whole solar system? There is a bit of friendly rivalry between the, uh, the different planets that we research. Um, uh, if you go to a really big conference, you'll often get a lot of different sessions. So some of us will be talking about, about Mars, but then there'll be a session next door about Pluto as well. And speaking for myself, I'm always fascinated about the other planets. Mm. I, I love learning about Venus, about the moon, and, and the moons of uh, Saturn and Jupiter particularly. So I am researching Mars at the moment, but I find all the planets fascinating. And I think that is, you'll find that amongst a lot of planetary scientists. We all have our favourites but everyone is very interested in the development of technologies which you can use across all the different planets and all the different missions that are out there. But is there anything from ExoMars then in terms of the technologies? You know, like you say, things can feed into research about other areas, other planets. Is there anything from ExoMars that you think is going to be particularly important that, that other people could employ? I think any technology that has proven itself or half proven itself will be considered for future missions. 
all the space agencies always build on past missions when they're creating future missions. They don't start again from scratch because that would be too expensive and too slow. So any proven technology that exists is always used to feed into the next level of technology. As we said, it sometimes takes many years for missions to get to the outer solar system. So some of those missions are a bit behind technology by the time they get there. But we can learn from how they performed on the way, how they are working while they're actually in operation. And we can use that to build the next generation of technology. OK, so what are you most looking forward to in terms of some of this data you're getting back? I asked Liam earlier, and, uh, <laughs> and he seems very excited about lots of different things. But for you, what, what are you most um, excited about? And what do you think you're going to find out that you maybe didn't know before? I am most excited about seeing what it's like during the dust storm season, because we haven't had a lot of information about the annual dust storm season from any landers or rovers particularly. So even though Schiaparelli didn't make it all the way to the surface, I can get a lot of information about the atmosphere as it went down in the dust storm season. And this is an annual season that occurs where more dust is lifted from the surface. So you're more likely to see more storms. And again, we pr can't predict that in advance yet. But if I can get data from this year's dust storm season, then maybe I can use it to get a better idea of what next year will be like. Yeah, no, it'll be it'll be so interesting. I guess getting all of that back. I'll, I'll look forward to um, to seeing how you're doing when you're starting to um, have your sleepless nights analysing <laughs> it all. Um, but a lot of countries. I mean, uh, you know, John sat here and said, "Well, this side is ESA and this side is the Russian side." Um, but lots and lots of different countries have been involved mm. um, with with the the, the trace gas orbit and Schiaparelli lander. Um, most people in our audience think that nine countries were involved. Uh, yes, nine would be my answer as well. Yep, yeah, excellent. That's good. So well done there. Um, <laughs> And uh, and uh, we're going to end the session. So if you haven't already voted on what you think a, a name for a lander would be, um, so maybe you don't like saying Schiaparelli, which I don't, uh, you might be able to think of a better name. <laughs> so you let us know, and we're going to show the answers to that very soon. Rianne, that's been really, really interesting um, talking about this. What's what's happening for you now then? I mean, this is obviously very, very interesting. You're obviously waiting with, with the hope that if something happens, it's going to happen very soon in terms of getting anything back. What's, what's your next few days look like? Uh, the next few days I will actually be going back to different simulations I'm running because although the data is now back from Schiaparelli, it is with the scientists who created the instruments. So I've got to wait for them to uh, calibrate the data and streamline it to that, send, then send it on to me. So I'll be preparing my analysis routines in preparation for that. Excellent. So it's going to be a busy time. Yes, yeah. Quite a lot of juggling numbers. Wonderful. Well, Rianne Chapman, thank you so much for joining me. Um, that's been been really interesting. Good luck with all of that, and I, I hope it um, I hope it goes the way you want it to, and that you um, you manage to get uh, everything uh, on track and on time. Thank you. thank you for joining us. Right, HJ, have you stopped talking about Comic Con now? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, that didn't work very well, did it? No. We tried to have a very sensible conversation here. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not e easily grounded from uh, all, all these different things. But, um... I'm here for. Until we start talking about cake, and then we've got HJ talking about Star Trek, I'm talking about cake, it's going to go downhill. <laughs> Davin does have a very good question, actually, which might be um, good for the next uh, session. He says, would discoveries about Mars's environmental condition help us better protect our environment on Earth? Um, which is actually a really good question. Um, so thank think, you very much for that, uh, Davin. David's got another quick question to ground myself away from all this sci-fi <laughs> stuff. Um, and David's just uh, wondering how Brexit will affect the UK's role in these missions in the SA, if at all. And do the experts worry that we could be sidelined? So that's a interesting, timely one, perhaps, for the future prospects of our involvement. I would also just like to thank, actually, there's been really good photos coming in, some really good cloud photos um, and some selfies and some study buddy pictures. We are trying to get those printed as soon as possible. Um, I would just like to point out that I really am liking Andrew's cloud picture. That is my favourite, mm. a nice little cloud drawing. Um, <laughs> so please do keep sending those through. It's studenthub at open.ac.uk or you can tweet us uh, at studenthub or you can use our uh, Twitter handle, so studenthublive16. Brilliant. We asked what you thought um, the name of the lander should be. So let's take a look and see what some of those answers were. Bob, Starship Enterprise, Leonard Nimmel, Docky, Dora the Explorer, um, <laughs> Rover McRover face. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Ziggy Stardust. Some very, very imaginative answers. Intrepid, Starship Enterprise, 
Alien Finder, well, that's a good one. EXO 2020, Fifi, brilliant, excellent. Thank you for filling those in. Aren't you all imaginative? That's that's really good work out there. Maybe, um, maybe we should put the Student Hub Live audience in charge of naming the next one.